Continuous improvement comes in lots of different flavors and styles. I'm Bella Engelbach, and I'm inviting you to journey with me to the edges of lean. Episode 94, Continuous Improvement and Raising Consciousness with Catherine Llewellyn. Catherine Llewellyn, who coaches and consults with business leaders, is a humanistic psychology. She works with leaders to go up to the next level, whether that is personally or in their business. I spoke with Catherine here at the Edges of Lean to learn what humanistic psychology is and how she helps these leaders raise their consciousness and reach their personal next level. Catherine Llewellyn, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you, Bella. It's lovely to have you here. Catherine, can you introduce yourself and tell us what it is that you do? Yes, I do um, a variety of types of coaching and, and consulting. So I'm generally working with people who are running a business or a section of a large business or their own business. And these are people who want to uh, go up a level in some way, whether they're making a significant change in the business or whether they are developing their own potential or some combination of those things. Sometimes they want to use somebody who's completely outside their circle, who can help them to manifest their potential more effectively, um, but still in line with their values. So it's um, that kind of that kind of work that I'm doing at the moment. So you you're working mostly with individuals or do you work with teams? I do work with teams sometimes. I used to do a lot of work with teams. At the moment, I'm mostly working one-on-one -on -one because I'm I'm more lazy now as I've got older. So I do <laughs> work with teams. <laughs> right, right. I understand that. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you what your pathway into doing what you do today? Yes, um, I was always very interested in um, how human beings actually work and how they how people can be happy and fulfilled. I was interested in that when I was very, very young. And I was really noticing that a lot of people didn't seem to be very fulfilled or didn't seem to be following what I would call following their truth. They were talking nonsense a lot of the time and they knew they were talking nonsense, but that was what was socially acceptable. So that's what they were doing. So I was very young and I could see this. Um, but it, And I was one of those annoying children, you know, who you didn't necessarily want to take with you to a social gathering because I would be quite outspoken. And I suppose that was the seed of it. But then coming forward from there, um, in my early 20s, I got involved with a group of people who were exploring self-awareness, potential, human potential, humanistic psychology. And I found this an absolute revelation and it really met me where I was and I, I loved it. And I started working with some of those people. We wanted to try and bring some of our values into the work life. So we started a business together and it wasn't long before, and I still don't know how this happened, but it wasn't long before I was actually the um, in-house communication skills trainer. And I was training people in, in how, they, how to use their voice and how to be more authentic. And uh, there was a lot of body work, a lot of somatic work. Um, it was really quite, you know, I was in my early 20s. How, what was I doing? But somehow this happened. and. Um, that evolved until I started working more broadly around communication skills. And then that work went more into teamwork and collaborative working. And then that went further into management skills, supervision skills, management skills, leadership skills. And then eventually over a kind of a 16 year period, I transitioned to actually working at board level with execs who wanted to lead change effectively in a way that pragmatically made sense for the business and also that really honored the goodwill in their organization. Because in those days, uh, one of the key issues was you could put significant change through a business, but at the end of it, everybody was gonna be completely exhausted and a lot of your best people would have left because they just wouldn't tolerate the, the difficulty and the stresses and strains of the change. And so my clients recognized that was a massive loss and a wastage to the business. And what they wanted was to lead change in such a way that the best people 
not only stayed, but wanted to stay and really flourished. And also that everyone came out of it in a good state rather than just completely drained. So that was a very particular brief I was given in various different ways with a lot of my clients over time. Um, and so I would work with them really quite deeply around what's the difference between those two different ways of leading change? How do you make that difference in the way that you're doing your leadership? Uh, and so as I'm listening to you, I'm hearing you say uh, things that make me think that this was really about how those leaders led as opposed to a change management methodology because I think you know a lot of us have been trained in probably multiple change ma management methodologies and a lot of that is about is this here's the step you do first is the step you do second you know you you find what are the communication uh, tools that you use how do you find the people who are going to be the advocates for the change you know so on and so forth um but what you're talking about is i think what are the leaders themselves doing um yes. and how are they and i used the word earlier manifest what are they manifesting mm -hmm. as they're leading the change yeah so am i getting that right that's exactly right and usually when i would start working with these clients i mean when i first started working at board level we were doing um, I was working within an, within an organization at the time. So I'd have a team working with me and we would go in and we would literally train all the middle and senior management. And we would start with the board so that they knew what everyone else was doing and they could support it. So that was more like a traditional organizational transformation program, as you might call it. But then when I left that organization um, in the mid 1990s, and went out on my own, it was then just me working with the clients. And so then what was often happening is they would sometimes have another subcontract organization doing the, um, almost not necessarily sheep dip, often tailored, but you know, where you put all the senior management through something. So they were doing, someone else was doing that. And as you say, I was then working with the board members to help them to lead the whole thing effectively. And Usually that would include, they would ask me to audit all the other things they were doing before we started. So I would look at these programs that they were hiring other people to do. I would look at these various uh, process um, protocols they were putting in. I would, I would, they would put me in a room basically with piles and piles of paper to read through and get my head around what they were doing. Then typically they would say, is there an, anything else we should be doing? And you- and, and I can imagine what your answer was yeah go on tell me what you think my answer was I, I i i think your answer would be why are you doing all these things what how, which of these things can you stop exactly i would say for god's sake please don't add any more things to what you're doing because because i would also go in and do diagnostic work wandering around the organization invisibly and chatting to people and sitting in on conferences and so on and i would say do you realize that 30 or 40 percent of this stuff People are just doing, uh, they're, they're just paying lip service to it. They think it's a waste of time. And even the managers trying to implement these things think it's a waste of time and exhausting and, and it's not working. So you've either got to drop those things or you've got to do them properly. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's not being done properly and, and people are just overwhelmed and exhausted and fed up. And sometimes they would cut things out. Sometimes they would go back and say, okay, these 18 things we're doing, let's say, why are we doing them? What was the purpose of doing them? Are they fulfilling that purpose? And if not, okay, let's take those three and merge them, drop that one over there, ramp up this one over here. Let's just change how we're doing this in a way that's going to be much more effective. So that, that was the kind of a thing that would happen at the beginning of the work very often. And then I would yeah. start back from that side of it. And then I'd be working just with these top execs around how are you interacting with all these other people who are doing these things? How are you interacting with each other? And we used to do these amazing scoping uh, processes with these people where it was, okay, let's, let's have you guys do some self-assessment around your leadership and around your teamwork. And let's have you guys come up with the criteria against which you're going to assess yourselves. How about that? 
and they, so they would design they would they, they would design their own they would design their own diagnostic process based on some principles that I would show them around how to do that which meant it was even the diagnostic process was tailored to them and their organization well very bespoke then for, for their particular needs yes yeah yeah so I think that's a uh, an important concept that we often run into in the lean and continuous improvement world is that an executive will come and they'll say, well, you know, I, I want to do this. I want to improve something, but they've got, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 other improvement efforts going on. And you said something very important. It was, it's about the purpose of those efforts. And they're not always linked to a singular purpose. Yeah. For, for the organization. And did you find that a lot? And, and were, I, were you working with organizations that then had to define their purpose or the purpose of their change? Yes. Well, it's a very interesting question because sometimes they had a very clear purpose for the change, but they hadn't actually joined the dots from the purpose to the implementation actions. Because right, yeah. some of the implementation actions were just there because they'd always been there or because the person who's in charge of HR really favours that approach. So that's what they always do wherever they go, you know, or the business process expert. That's what they always do. Or sometimes, and this is a bit embarrassing, sometimes the CEO has read an article in Harvard Business Review <laughs> about a fantastic method. And then they, they just chuck it at the board and say, implement that through the business. Six months later, they've spent millions trying to do this. And they come back and say, right, we've done this. He goes, well, why were you doing that? Well, because you said you, no, the article. I didn't mean go and spend all this money. So the, the, the amount of sort of dropped balls between communication was extraordinary. So, so yet sometimes they needed to get more clear about the context of the change, but usually they knew what that was. Usually they had a really clear, um, waste reduction or profit improvement or cost reduction specific set of targets. And very often they actually had a contextual thing around, we want to equip ourselves better for what we know is coming in our market. Or right. we, want, yeah. we, we, want to, um, improve, we want to improve the atmosphere in the business because we've got high turnover rates of staff or we're getting low um, staff satisfaction figures. Or we just know in our hearts it's it's not as good as we want it to be. So very often they had that information, but it hadn't been strategically uh, worked together with the implementation planning. That was often the difficulty, a kind of a, a gap between the driving purpose and the implementation planning. And was that was that, as you said, always a little bit throw it over the wall you know the hr department will take care of so that the change leaders will take care of this uh, it will take care of this and i will go on my merry way but, but were there other reasons for uh for the communication gap um i think yeah i think another reason is more of a psychological reason which is um thinking about broad context is a completely different way of thinking than thinking about tactical action plans. I think it's almost like we use a different part of the brain for that. And a lot of organizations, even at board level, people are thinking much more tactically than strategically. So they're not stepping back and going, hold on a minute, how does this all fit together? And, and, and so very often, like psychologically, people are just running to keep up. And just to try and make sure they don't lose their job, try and survive the fact they've got a difficult person to work with, or they don't really understand what their chief exec is asking them to do, or the chief exec doesn't understand why the people on the board just keep saying yes to him or her and never come up with any new ideas. You know, very often they're dealing with all these everyday problems, so they just don't have the space. And I think anyone in their own life can recognize this, you know, in our own lives, how often do we just lean back? and strategically say, hold on a minute, what am I doing with my life? Strategically speaking. Yeah, 
And, and it's exactly the same in an organization. In an organization, it's even more difficult because it's so much more complex. So very often that's the case. And it's often made worse by the fact that people are exhausted. They are um, putting a load of toxins into their body, which is actually bad for the thinking process. I'm talking about coffee, alcohol, you know, not getting enough rest, not getting enough exercise, um, it's too much time under fluorescent lights, which were never designed for offices in the first place. You know, all, all of these things that people do and that I've done, you know, mm -hmm. actually interfere with our ability to think strategically at, at that higher level, which is where you can see the gaps and the mismatches very obviously when you're in that space. But when you're in it, you know, when you're at, you know, at the grindstone, it's, it's really easy to miss it. So that's, it's such an interesting concept, Catherine, because one of the things that we talk about a lot in Lean is the idea of going to the gamba, that is actually going and seeing what's happening in the workplace, you know, being there, you know, what ha what's happening in the factory, what's happening um, on the sales floor, what's happening in the design studio, you know, what's really going on in the organization. And it's very important to do that. But I think the point that you're raising is that at the executive level, there also needs to be that a way to mentally connect all those things, make sure that they're headed, all headed in the right direction or they're, they're headed in the direction that is aligned with the purpose of the company. Yeah. Um, and it does take, I think, a very different psychology, one that um, not everybody is prepared for as they get promoted um, mm. into into leadership. Um, yeah. yeah, I I, think I, I often yeah. have seen a brilliant tactician promoted to you know to to a higher level of leadership and then really flounder um, because of that uh, inability to to both see context but also then be aware of the impact of their behavior, what they say, what they do on other people. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, that said, I mean, pretty much everyone I've ever worked with has the capacity to think strategically and they're able to do it when they have the space for it and, and when they actually encourage one another to do it. I had a, a situation once where I, I was invited in to work with an organization that um, was about to expand, it was about to expand exponentially. They, they were in the communications industry. They did this complicated communications equipment for call centers. And they, they were about to expand significantly because sales were going really well. And they knew if they didn't do something about the leadership, they, they would expand, the sales would increase, but things would start breaking in terms of the, their, their ability to deliver because they knew that the current leadership approach wasn't stretchy enough for what they were going to need. And one of the first things I did was I went in and did a like a briefing session, training session with a group of people, which was some people on the board, some HR people, some IT people, some quality people. It was like a group of people. And I said, right, the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to sit here in silence for five minutes. And How uncomfortable, Catherine. They, 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 spent, they then spent 15 minutes arguing with me as to why we shouldn't do this. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. And we then spent five minutes in silence, right, because they realized I was not going to stop. They realized this was going to happen, right? So they went, oh, right, you're right, right? So they, they did that. And we, they, they, just because of that simple five minutes, they went into a completely different mindset. They were suddenly that much more able to deal with some of the things we were then going to work. I was actually then teaching them how to do the diagnostic, the qualitative diagnostic work. That, that I was there to help them with. And years later, when I talked to those people, they said that five minutes was the most memorable thing of the entire program and everything they were doing in their business, because that was a complete paradigm shift experience for them to go into just uh, uh, five minutes, right? Strong. Yeah. And what were some of their arguments for, for not doing it? Was it a waste of time, they thought, or they needed yeah. to do something? Yeah, it, a waste of time. Uh, this is woo wee woo wee new age stuff. Mm. Are you trying to hypnotize us? Um, <laughs> what, why do you think we need to do that? 
you know, are you is are you being condescending in some way? You know, that you think we're children who've got to be told to sit still or, you know, they came up with everything you could possibly think of. And it actually afterwards, when we at towards the end of the day, some of them said, I cannot believe some of the things I said to you this morning, Catherine. Listening, listen, when I remember what I said, I can't believe I said such, such ridiculous things to you that obviously was coming from my distress, my fear of just sitting there for five minutes. They were astonished at their own resistance. And so really what they had to do was to accept your leadership for five minutes, right? And that was... That's also something that's that's hard for people to do, um, particularly when they're in a leadership position, is to step back and allow somebody else to lead, even if it's for a short period of time. True. I mean, which is even more ridiculous if they're actually paying that person to lead. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> Catherine, you've done um, some work with organizations that are doing lean transformations. Can you tell us about how your work fits in those in those transformations? Yes, um, and uh, I've, I've got one example where an organization, um, it was actually the operations division of a high street bank. So there were 9,000 people in the division and I was working with the general manager of the division and three other guys from his board that he'd picked for the program. And they had um, all the IT people on board, the HR people on board, and all of the other technical people on board that needed to be to make this particular significant change, which involved relocating a lot of people, closing branches, uh, mm. opening up sites, um, grabbing sort of headquarters type activities from one place, putting it into another. It's very, very complex piece. And they said, we know we're going to get this done. We know we're going to achieve the cost reduction and the profit contribution targets, but we want to do it in a way where we've got all our best people staying at the end and everyone's in a good state. And also that we don't hate ourselves <laughs> at the end of it. Okay. So um, I, uh, I said, all right, um, do you want me to sit in on a couple of your conferences and just find out what I think's going on? And I did. And I came back and met with my client and I had done um a, like a rich picture on a bit on like three big pieces of flip chart paper stuck together with just um dumped on it images and shapes and colors and words of my impressions from these conferences that was my report okay and i went through this with him and he said this is really intuitive this is amazing i want to show this to my guys and then i want you to work with my guys. I said, great, I will work with your guys if you're in every session with them wholeheartedly doing the program with them. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. He was surprised. He was used to people just, you know, groveling doing. for work. Yeah. Um, and they had a massive budget, these people. It was like something like 400 million a year or something, cost base. Wow. And um, so my fee was like, you know, Staples budget. It was nothing. <laughs> by comparison. So he went off and he saw them and um, came back. And one of the guys said, I've just finished an MBA. And that nearly killed me. I don't want to do another program now. So at first he really didn't want to do it. The other two were really up for it. It was really interesting. So we got together and I said, okay, we're going to scope this out in terms of what kind of leaders you want to be and how you're going to become that way. And we did a diagnostic piece based on a system called the seven energy levels model. Have you heard of it? No, no, tell, tell us about that. You had. I'd be very surprised if you had, because I'm one of only about two or three people that is actually licensed to use this method, um, which I co-developed with a professor who I was working with at university. So this is based on the Eastern Chakra system, which everyone's heard of. Mm -hmm. and the idea is that every organization has its own chakra system, okay? And if it's working well on every single chakra level, well, it's working well altogether. And by the way, the, the, the system level is the solar plexus chakra. It's the one that will organization structure process. So I taught them how to use this model to do a diagnostic piece on 
themselves individually, themselves as a team, and their organization. And to then come up with all their own rich pictures, and then to create vision on every single level, and then to come up with transition statements that took them from one to the other, and then come up with a system of themes they were going to work on that actually fulfilled all of those transitions. Now, this is a very, very complicated piece of work, and it took yes. three, three months to do it. And at the end of it, we had a set of themes for the group to work on, and each individual guy had a set of themes to work on as an individual leader as well. And I then worked with them as a group every month for a day and a half. And I worked with the individual guys every month for a day in person, plus a day where I shadowed them in their work and kind of supported and um, assisted them to help them with their own reflection, self-observation, self-troubleshooting and so on in the workplace. And this program was two and a half years long. And each theme that the group went through was two months. And one of the themes that I think will probably grab your imagination. Oh, by the way, they came up with their own name for the program and their own name for the themes. And the program was called Frogs to Princes. Ah, it was amazing. Right. <laughs> and they would say, are we still frogs or are we princes yet? You know, and, and as they went through it, one of the themes they had was a thing called Chi Cascade. And what that meant was they got very connected to the notion of energy, good energy, good energy in a meeting, good energy in themselves and in the way they were showing up. And they said, yeah, but OK, we can do that for ourselves and we can do that in a board meeting. But how do we kind of cascade that down through the rest of the organization? How do we cascade that chi? Right. So we did what, a, what a great question to even ask. Right. I'm, that's that's a. A brilliant question to ask, yes. I know. Well, it, it came out of all the diagnostic work we did. They identified that was a specific, because a lot of leaders are really frustrated about the fact that even if they do human potential work themselves, how do they transmit that down line? How can that help somebody eight levels lower down? How do they do that, right? With Without yeah. going into some sort of uh, really boring, predictable, send a magazine out every week telling everybody to be more open. I mean, you just want to shoot yourself in the face. Which it just never works, right? But that yeah. certainly not on its own. Not on its own, right? So, so we did a whole piece on that, and they were trying out all sorts of things, and they were learning how to brief their people better, and they were setting up. They created this whole process owner teams thing, running through the business, and they generated an extraordinary culture downline as a result of doing that. But they actually. They knew that theme was going to be a difficult one to do. So they didn't do it theme number one. They did it theme number six, I think, something like that. So the other themes would have given them a lot more strength and built their capacities. So when they got to that theme, it was easier for them to get to grips with it. So this is like layer, layered work where you're working on one thing in the foreground and there are several other things working in the background and you're following through on the last thing, whilst at the same time, all your people are doing all the technical stuff, you know, all the standard protocols that need to be done so that they were bringing that very, very human, inspirational, but grounded leadership that then brought and, life to the staff. And then I imagine also building better leaders in the organisation as they yeah. did this, the people the people at each level in the organization that would have opportunities to learn and practice all of those skills which led to a healthy culture and the ability to actually a complete transformation that's right and it also made it easier for them to when they had to shuffle people around it made it easier for them to do that in a more intelligent way because they could also be much more sensitive they they did a theme specific specifically on understanding people better, being much more sensitive and understanding people better, and then seeing what's the best fit for that person in line with what they were trying to do. And one of my favorite moments was when they came back, and this was after doing the Chi Cascade work, because it fitted with that. They came back and said, Catherine, as a result of this work we've been doing, and I've still got very moved when I think of this, <laughs> we, 
we were about to do a program of redundancy as part of what we were doing. We just saved two and a half thousand jobs that we were going to have to make redundant because of this work we've done around much better ways of managing the energies in the organization, the skills and talents in the organization. So two and a half thousand people, their roles have changed, they're deployed differently, but they have not had to be made redundant. And they were so proud of themselves. I mean, uh, that's, uh, that is, you know, one of the things that we always say, or we often say at the beginning of a lean transformation, and it's an ideal, is nobody should lose their job about this because people don't want to engage in a transformation that will result in them potentially losing their job. Right. right. But it's very hard to say that because leaders really have to adopt this idea that if this person's in, the, in my organization, there is probably something that we need them to do that would improve our capacity, that would improve our ability to meet our customer needs. But we've got We've got to find that. And that seems like so much work. It's so much easier just to peel people off and take the, the cost savings. And as we know, the impact of doing that impedes transformation because people become very suspicious and careful and don't want to participate. But it it also leaves um, an, a long-term impact on the organization of people uh, really not being as fully committed as they were before because they're they're afraid all the time. So true. And, so that and, is really brilliant. And le leaders hate doing that. They hate it. Uh, often, a lot of people think that leaders really happy to let loads of people go. They do not like it. There was, I had another situation where a client of mine said, um, Catherine, we've got to reduce our headcount by 20%. And we've got these big meetings coming up with senior management to brief them on this. And this client said to me, Catherine, something I've understood about myself is, when I've got to do something like this, I hate doing it. I feel very uncomfortable. And my default is to then go really mechanical and withdraw my emotions from the situation. So what I want you to do, Catherine, is to come and support me not to do that. I want you to sit in these meetings and I want you to manage the energy in the meeting without saying anything, such that it makes it easier for these people to hear this message. And I want you to be sitting there opposite me so I can see you to remind me to stay emotionally connected. So I did that with all these meetings and people were really surprised that A, they heard the information much more clearly because you know when people are upset, they can't hear properly. They actually heard the information and they were a lot less upset about it than they expected to be. And the whole thing went through so much more easily and people were a lot less damaged than they otherwise would have been because he had that sensitivity to call me in to do that mm. you know I had that capacity to do that great but that would have been useless if he hadn't had that sensitivity and foresight and generosity of spirit and humility to call me in and ask me to do that piece of work and again I that's think those are... really touching to me I just was thrilled yeah, to... yeah. I think those are the kinds of leaders that we would like to work for Right. Yeah. That, that's the um, and I'm just fascinated by the idea and I don't and I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but I'm fascinated idea about the idea of these bankers um, becoming in touch with um, terms like energy, with emotion, with um, I presumably starting to realize their impact on other people. Yeah. For, for some of them, what was a tipping point that helped them? move away from well you know i'm a i'm a banker if i don't have my pinstripe uh suit and my wing tick shoes and my face my banker face i'm not doing my job i think well th these in a way i have an advantage because the sort of people who choose to work with me have a degree of openness otherwise they yeah. would you know because yeah. they take one look at me and they know that if they're not going to be open it's not going to be nice you know, it's just, it's not going to be fun. So th there are people who just don't want to work with someone like me at all. And actually it, it wouldn't work anyway if we did, because they're just not yeah. open. But I think one thing I've been told that people really find makes a difference for them is I uh, give people a very high quality of attention when I work with them. I really pay attention to them. 
And I have a thing which in my trade is called unconditional positive regard. So that means I go in with the assumption that this person is an amazing human being already, and they have a good heart, and they have values, and they can connect with their truth, and that they are worthy of being supported. So I go in, I actually feel that all the way through me as an experience. And that partly comes from my training, partly from all the personal growth work I've done, and partly from all the experience I've had working with clients. It's, it's, an, it's a capacity that can be developed, and I have that developed, which I ought to have by now after decades of doing this work. So, yeah. and, and they feel that people feel very touched by that. They, they feel, my God, I, 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 re- I feel like I'm a valid human being here. I feel this person's really paying attention. So I'm going to pay attention to what she's saying. And they also pick up on the fact that I'm, I have a lot of vitality, wellness, energy. My mind is sharp. There's a lot going on with me that shows people that something I'm doing is working for me. And they go, well, that's interesting. How are you doing that? You know, that's not coincidence. And and I I always, for a long time, I considered it's part of my job to be in at least a bit of a better state than my clients. So I'm at least demonstrating or embodying something that they can find Uh, interesting and that can inspire them to embrace more of what they want to embrace for themselves as well. So I think that's the first thing that people kind of respond to that thing. There's an app when I create an atmosphere in the space, when I'm working with people, I put a lot of attention into setting up the room, the space, the situation. Very often we're off site in a hotel or something. They've had to travel through beautiful countryside to get there. Um, They may have had to stay overnight in a beautiful countryside to get that. You know, I I use all kinds of tricks, if you like, to set it up that they're more likely to be in a space of uh, valuing themselves and feeling ready to at least explore. And so by by doing all of that, it sounds to me that you're telling them this is already different from... The last business meeting you went to, or what you experienced in you in school or in in university, this is this is something very different, and I'm, so we're expecting something different yeah. to happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I, can you repeat again? I I love what you said um, about about your your positive um regard for people because it's so aligned with the lean concept of respect for people and i think this is a beautiful definition would you mind saying it again of course unconditional positive regard unconditional positive regard so that means as you're looking at a person you you say as you said this is a marvelous human being this is this is someone who is capable of growth and change um no matter what they've been told they've what assessments they've had done in the past or diagnoses or you know whatever it is that we do to people yeah. whether they've been told that they're a good person or a bad person they they're still a marvelous human capable marvelous human being capable of growth and with their own sovereignty with their own right to choose their own growth and their own capacity of growth exactly it's a humanistic psychology expression that one and i i'm very very deep into humanistic psychology i find it very supportive for my work and for myself as a person and can you just explain what humanistic psychology is just for a minute yes so um You know how psychoanalysis started in the 1930s with Freud and it became initially only very, very rich people could afford it. Yeah. But then it became more and more main, more and more people could afford it. And so psychoanalysis was a whole thing where you would actually uh, begin with a very deep case analysis of everything that had happened to you as a child, everything awful you could think of. And uh, uh, psychoanalysis exists still today. And for a lot of people, it's incredibly valuable. At that point, that was all there was. And there came a point later, I think it was around about the 1950s, 60s, when there was a pushback that said, this is not ideal for everybody. For some people, a, a very different approach is much more appropriate, which is much more of a deal with what's in the present first. 
go into the past as you are called to do so as required, but not as your first port of call. So, and don't start from the place of this is a sick person who needs to be fixed. Mm. Start from a place of this is a, a well person who wants to enhance their experience of life, wants to maximize their potential. They want to grow as opposed to they want to be fixed. And they've got the right to do that. And they've got the natural tendency to do that unless you stand on their head and actively prevent them. So they've got the possibility of personal growth available to them, all being well, you know, for for many people, that's the case. So that was kind of the beginnings of humanistic psychology, which now has, it started off as a kind of distinct thing, whereas now it's everywhere. Virtually every therapist you'll find, virtually every facilitator you'll find is actually following some of the humanistic psychology principles to some extent. And then the only question is, are they any good at it? Mm, yeah. There are people who believe the principles of humanistic psychology who've got a bit further to travel before they can fully embody it, because it's, it's very demanding on the, the inner, you know, the ego can take a bit of a bashing, right? You have to really get over yourself to do humanistic psychology well, you know, and I have an ego, we all have an ego, right? And yeah, I right. hit mine sometimes, right? So, but... <laughs> Part of my part of my duty on my path is to recognize that, get over myself again, <laughs> right? Yet again, um, and then and then reconnect to those very beautiful principles. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, that terrific explanation. Catherine Wellen, how can people find you if they want to continue this conversation? And I hope they do. I would love for people to soak up my podcast which is yes. truth truth and transcendence because truth we all know, transcendence yeah, yeah we all know when we find our truth and connect to it we can transcend so um it's that's the best place to go and on every show notes there are ways of contacting me but i always think it's great listen listen to a few more of my episodes and then you'll get a sense of whether i'm someone you'd actually like to talk to in person and if you'd like to talk to me in person i am thrilled to talk to anyone who wants to contact me that's terrific. Thank you. Hey, Catherine, what is your one piece of advice for a young person starting out? I would say to a young person, sit down and work out what are the questions you'd like to get answers to. So mm -hmm. rather than looking around and finding people like me who just want to randomly give you advice <laughs> based on my wisdom of everything and what I think you should be doing, you know, Okay, it might have some value, but you've only got so much time and energy and bandwidth and your time is valuable. So I would say, work out the questions you want answers to. And they might be big questions, they might be little questions. And then go to the people who you admire and ask them those questions. And the other thing I, I, I advise young people to do is, when you do that, do something for that person in exchange. So you're mm. making... Because otherwise, you are reinforcing the idea that you are less than that other person, that you are the supplicant at their feet. Whereas you are an autonomous being, no matter how old you are, and you are perfectly capable of doing something valuable for that person. Cut their grass, do the washing up, you know, take the dog for a walk, whatever it is. Do something for them in exchange for them doing something for you. And you are immediately setting up a pattern for yourself of exchange, which whatever you want to do will stand you in very, very, very good stead. And then when those questions have been answered, create a new list or keep asking the same questions over and over again. I think that's the advice I would offer to a young person. Terrific advice. Thank you so much. Catherine Wellen, thank you very much for traveling with me to the edges of lean. My pleasure. It's been a joy. This is Bella Engelbach, and I'd like to thank Catherine Llewellyn for being my guest on The Edges of Lean. What did you learn from this conversation? What ideas did it spark for you? We would love to hear from you. Find Catherine at yesyounow.today and check out her podcast, Truth and Transcendence, or you can connect with her on LinkedIn. 
find me on LinkedIn or at leadforhumans.com or comment wherever you watch or listen. Subscribe and tell a friend about the Ages of Lean. Please join me in exploring more of the Ages of Lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicatorscott.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelbach with support from Podcast Inc. This is a Lean for Humans production.